Okay, so in today's class, uh, let us uh, move to a new topic, and uh, that is the study of uh, creation and annihilation operators in the context of many-body physics. Before I explain to you this particular topic, I want to refresh your memory about the uh, uh, topics we had just covered in the last lecture. So basically, in the last lecture, I started with this uh, problem of mass, uh, one mass tied to one spring and I studied that problem quantum mechanically and that is a very familiar one from your undergraduate days, but it serves to illustrate the effectiveness of this technique of creation and annihilation operators. So, the creation and annihilation operators that you encounter in that particular problem refer to a creation and annihilation of excitations of the system. So, that means the, uh, the mass tied to a spring has a certain ground state and it has a first excited state and second excited state and so on. So, what the creation operator will do is it will take one of the states and uh, if you act it on a creation operator, it will become the next excited state. So, that is pretty much the role of the creation operator. So, annihilation will do the reverse. So, the bottom line is that in this, uh, in that particular example, a creation and annihilation operators they excite uh, and uh, they create and destroy quanta of excitations. So, they do not uh, create particles because that mass is uh, the particle which is uh, anyway that particular mass is just one mass and it is uh, always there and there is one spring and it is tied to that mass and it is always there. So, what is being created and destroyed are basically the quanta of excitations. So, that means the excitations uh, manifest themselves as quanta. So, they are the ones which are being created and being destroyed. So, the next example we studied was a generalization of one mass tied to one spring and that is basically a sequence of masses and springs alternating uh, on a straight line. So, in that particular example, we encountered a, uh, also a very similar result namely that you could create and excite quanta, uh, but uh, the, the excitations now have a wavelength. So, that means that, so in addition to specifying the number of quanta you are exciting, you should also specify the mode. The mode is labeled by the wavelength or the wave number alternatively. So, if you specify the wave number which is inversely related to wavelength, then you can go ahead and specify the number of quanta associated with that particular mode. So, then you will be uh, describing the excitations of uh, that system containing a mass and a spring and a mass and so on that alternating uh, sequence. So, uh, the uh, excitations there are clearly the sound waves that propagate in that system. So, we were able to successfully find the energy versus momentum relation for those sound waves. So, that would also be the same uh, if you treated the system classically. So, the difference between the classical treatment and the quantum treatment is that the energy in the classical treatment will be continuously from 0 to anything, but in the quantum treatment it will have a minimum non-zero value which is called a zero point energy and after that it will uh, be some in it will appear in discrete multiples of uh, that particular quantum. So, that, that quantum of energy that we had just found. So, we did that and then the next uh, topic uh, we studied was uh, the quantization of the electromagnetic field. So, just like in these particular cases, uh, the mass tied to a spring or the sequences of masses and spring, there was a kind of a medium within which those sound waves were propagating. So, but here in the electromagnetic field, there is no medium and yet uh, some disturbance propagates. So, the implication there is that the electromagnetic field which is an abstract mathematical construct itself serves as a proxy for a medium. So, even though it is not a physical medium, it is a mathematical construct, but that is that itself behaves like a medium and, uh, and disturbances can propagate in that type of uh, abstract medium. So, uh, so the idea was that uh, you know we had studied the electromagnetic waves uh, earlier uh, classically. 
So, now we were successful in the last class to study electromagnetic uh, waves uh, or electromagnetic uh, radiation uh, quantum mechanically. So, there also we found in a very similar uh, vein uh, namely uh, sim very similar to the earlier example of the mass tide mass spring mass spring sequence. So, we found that the disturbances that uh, propagate in an electromagnetic field when you study them quantum mechanically are also uh, quantized in that sense in the same sense namely it will have a minimum 0 point energy uh, the total energy will have a non-zero minimum and uh, the subsequent uh, higher energies uh, appear in multiples of some uh, fundamental quantum and those uh, the quanta of excitations of the electromagnetic field are called photons. So, just like in the earlier case the uh, quanta of uh, the uh, waves that are propagating in that uh, mass spring sequence which is meant to mimic a one dimensional solid that is sound waves propagating in a one dimensional solid. So, if you treat it quantum mechanically you would be describing phonons. So, that means the quanta of sound. So, in all these three examples basically one thing is common in all these three examples and that is that the uh, what is being created and destroyed are not uh, actual particles, but they are quanta of excitations that are being created and destroyed. So, now I want to uh, shift my uh, emphasis and uh, interpretation and uh, try to see if I can introduce creation and annihilation of uh, not just uh, quanta of excitations, but material particles. So, I want to create and annihilate uh, quantum quantum mechanical particles themselves. So, of course, you might be wondering where on earth would you find such a application because normally if you have a system of particles you would normally expect particles to be uh, neither created nor destroyed you know you, you grew up with this uh, notion that matter cannot be created or destroyed. But remember that uh, Einstein taught us differently he said that matter and energy are interchangeable. So, in fact, uh, you can uh, take uh, matter and uh, antimatter and you can combine them both will have mass matter has mass antimatter has mass, but if you combine them you will get pure energy. So, matter will disappear and it will lead to pure energy alternatively you can have uh, energy spontaneously you know spitting out particles like energy can disappear and that energy can get converted and uh, manifest itself as material particles. So, you see that happening uh, quite uh, all the time in this large hadron collider because that is exactly what it does it takes the kinetic energy of the colliding particles and uh, it, that kinetic energy which is uh, huge in uh, you know tera electron volts that gets converted to uh, elementary particles. So, when you have two protons colliding head on uh, they will lead to a shower of elementary particles because the kinetic energy of collisions uh, is so enormous that that energy gets converted into matter. So, that is allowed by special relativity you know that that is a rather uh, striking uh, phenomenon if you think about it say if you at the microscopic level it seems rather uh, unremarkable it seems like uh, I mean you might think what is the big deal, but if you just uh, you know step back and think about it it, it really is striking it is as if uh, suppose you know you have uh, two people like riding a bicycle and they come uh, towards each other and they collide and the energy of the collision. Uh, gets uh, is so large that that can be converted to another bicycle. So, now you have three bicycles. So, it is almost like that. So, if the energy of the collision is m c squared where m is the mass of the bicycle then uh, it is as if that collision will produce a third bicycle. So, of course, that does not happen with bicycles, but it happens with elementary particles all the time in the large hadron collider. So, why I brought this up is basically because that is the whole point of introducing this concept of creating and annihilating particles. 
because there are many examples uh, especially in relativistic physics where the energy of uh, relativistic particles uh, themselves are converted to material objects. So, it makes perfect sense to talk about um, matter not being conserved rather having a s s formalism that allows you to create and annihilate material particles. Okay, so, that was the uh, motivation for uh, introducing uh, creation and annihilation of material particles. But uh, you might think that that is therefore peculiar to uh, relativistic physics where energy and matter are interchangeable. So, you might be wondering then is, is that uh, of relevance to me if I want to specialize in condensed matter physics. So, the answer is yes because even in condensed matter you have uh, something called a hole. You see the positron was a hole uh, according to Dirac. So, even in condensed matter like in semiconductors you do have a hole. So, you have a sea of conduction electrons and if you excite a electron from the valence band you create a hole in the valence band and a electron in the conduction band and the hole in the valence band effectively behaves like an antiparticle. And uh, so, it per makes perfect sense. So, initially you know there was just a photon and that photon gets swallowed up by the semiconductor and uh, if its energy is more than the band gap then uh, the photon gets the photon is pure energy it gets swallowed up by the semiconductor and it creates uh, two material particles one is the hole in the valence band and an electron in the conduction band. So, earlier there was no material particle of any kind there was just uh, pure energy which is the photon. But now that photon disappeared and in its place you have two material particles. So, you see that that kind of uh, idea also is useful and uh, quite commonly seen even in condensed matter uh, situations. So, which is the reason why I feel like now is the right time to introduce this concept of creating and annihilating material particles. So, so I am going to gradually. Um, introduce these uh, technical concepts to you. So, it will be somewhat unusual and somewhat different from uh, what you saw earlier because the earlier methods uh, will not be directly applicable here. So, even though we are creating and annihilating something, but now that we are creating and annihilating material particles. So, it is uh, the mathematics is somewhat different. Uh, so, we will have to go slow there. So, I am going to start with this Hamiltonian uh, just stare at 8.54. So, this Hamiltonian basically refers to uh, the uh, Hamiltonian of a system of uh, particles. So, I am going to assume quantum particle because now it is all quantum mechanics. The first half of the course was about classical mechanics and from uh, chapter 7 onwards we are doing quantum mechanics. So, it is purely quantum mechanical and uh, but still you see you have a, a bunch of n quantum mechanical particles and so they will all have this kinetic energy. So, we are going to assume the non-relativistic. So, the kinetic energy is p squared by 2 m, but they also mutually interact with each other that means they have a, a pairwise potential energy. Okay, so, uh, and the pairwise potential energy basically uh, depends on the distance between any two particles. So, that is the reason why I have written it as r i minus r j and the distance means the magnitude of the distance between them. So, that would be typical for example, if the charged particles uh, they would exhibit uh, Coulomb repulsion for example or they can be neutral and exhibit some other type of uh, force. It can be at 6 12 potential some Van der Waals force something something. So, it can be anything. Uh, so, it is basically a two body f interaction. So, so that means the potential energy of the entire system is the sum of the pairwise potential energies of uh, any any pair of particles. So, that is called the two body forces. You can also have three body forces and so on. So, you can have a situation where the total potential energy is not merely a sum of uh, the uh, pairwise potential you, you can have some extra contribution merely because there are more than two bodies 
uh, and that is of course not common in condensed matter, but it is uh, fairly common in nuclear physics. But I am going to uh, relegate that to some exercise at some stage, I will just briefly uh, address that question as maybe in the exercises. But right now let us focus on two body interaction. So, now uh, this uh, 8.54 uh, being a quantum mechanical Hamiltonian is going to have stationary states that means it obeys uh, there will be some solutions of the time independent Schrodinger equation. So, that means you can you should be able to write down wave functions such as h psi equal to e psi. So, but remember that this wave function uh, is a function of the positions of all of these particles. So, that means the wave function is going to be a function of r 1, r 2 all the way up to r n. But then uh, you know uh, it is not enough to merely solve for this time independent Schrodinger equation because then you have to also uh, take into account the fact that if you interchange any two particles the uh, wave function should have a well defined symmetry because that is what we have learnt in our quantum mechanics that if you have more than one particle in the system the wave function is either symmetric under exchange of the positions of any two particles or anti symmetric. So, if it is uh, symmetric you call the, those particles bosons if the wave function is anti symmetric you call them fermions. So, that is what we have learnt and I am going to stick to that. So, therefore, uh, we can easily make this uh, assertion that if you have a wave function with a function of r 1, r 2 up to r n and r i and r j are any two uh, positions of uh, your particles if you interchange r i and r j you are going to pick up a, a sign and that sign is either plus 1 for bosons or minus 1 for fermion. Okay. Uh, so, you see the bottom line is this that when you solve this Schrodinger equation many times uh, you will uh, I mean the so solution that you uh, derive especially if there is more than one particle in fact that is uh, not uh, done very frequently. but uh, so, you can uh, stumble upon uh, you know a wave function uh, say if that imagine there are two particles. So, that means the wave function psi is a function of r 1 and r 2. So, then you will be called upon to solve an equation such as h psi equal to e psi. So, now the uh, by some effort uh, because it will require some effort you may be you will use separation of variables typically that is what you will do you will use separation of variables you will write psi as f of r 1 times g of r 2 and then you will find f f and g. But then uh, you know f of r 1 times g of r 2 is not uh, it is neither symmetric nor anti symmetric under the exchange of r 1 and r 2. So, especially in f and g are very different and typically they will be in uh, if you just uh, stumble upon some some solution like that. So, now the question is uh, you need a, a mechanism or a algorithm which will take a wave function that happens to be a solution of the Schrodinger equation. So, in that sense it is a legitimate stationary state of the system, but then it does not uh, yet reflect any particular symmetry of uh, that you expect namely it is neither fully symmetric nor it is it fully anti symmetric under the pairwise exchange of particles which is what you would expect in nature. So, what you need now is a mechanism which allows you or an operator which allows you to take a wave function which is just a stationary state of the system, but it is not uh, it does not have any well defined symmetry. So, you want to take such a wave function and uh, operate it with some particular operator which I am calling symmetrization operator. So, you operate it with a symmetrization operator it should lead to a wave function which has the appropriate symmetry that you are looking for. So, that means you can have a symmetrization operator that uh, takes some unsymmetrized wave function and turns it into a fermionic wave function namely 
that that wave function will be fully anti-symmetric under the exchange of any two positions or you can have a situation where it takes a fully unsymmetrized wave function and turns it into a fully symmetrized wave function where the wave function is uh, fully symmetric under the interchange of any two positions. So, so what we need to do now is to first introduce uh, such an operator. So, I have to uh, construct an operator which does that. So, the question is how would I do that? See, because I will be needing all this, uh, we should not lose sight of uh, what we are trying to accomplish. So, remember the title of this section, it says creation and annihilation operators in many body physics. So, my ultimate goal is to define operators that create and annihilate particles. So, the, the reason why I am introducing uh, symmetrization and anti symmetrization, it is not, uh, it is of course, uh, it is useful in its own right in the sense that when you stumble upon uh, wave functions that are neither symmetric nor anti symmetric, it is comforting to know that uh, some operator exists that allows you to symmetrize them or anti symmetrize them properly. But that is of course, a minor motivation. The real motivation is because you see if you have a system of n particles and you remove or add a particle, so that is what you are, you are supposed to do, right? you are supposed to create and annihilate particles. So, when you create a particle for example, there is no guarantee that the uh, wave function of the system after creating will have any proper symmetry. So, even though you started off with a wave function which has proper symmetry, blindly adding one more particle will actually invariably spoil any symmetry that might exist in the wave function. And you will see that uh, the most natural way of adding or subtracting particles from the system do in fact uh, immediately violate any of those symmetries. So, it is for that reason you absolutely require an operator that will restore the appropriate symmetry on the wave function. So, that is the reason why I am introducing this concept. Okay, so, let us proceed. So, how would I uh, do that? So, how would I take a wave function that is neither anti-symmetric nor symmetric and act it upon by an appropriate wave function and make the wave function either properly symmetric or anti-symmetric? How would I do that? So, the answer is given by this rather formidable looking uh, uh, prescription in 8.56. So, what, what is 8.56? What it says is that you start off with a wave function. So, there is a psi which depends on r1, r2 all the way up to rn and it is neither symmetric nor anti symmetric. Okay? I mean most of the time it is neither. But what you want is you want to convert that into a wave function that describes say n bosons. So, if you wanted to describe n bosons, you have to select s equals plus 1. So, this is that subscript s. So, what it says is that uh, you construct this summation. So, this p refers to the permutation. So, that means suppose you have 3 particles. So, the permutation of uh, 3 objects could be this. This is one such example. So, you can have many possible for in fact, you have n factorial possible permutations of n numbers. So, one possible permutation is you take uh, 1 make it go to 2, you take 2 go to make, make it go to 1, but you do not touch 3 that is one possible permutation. So, like that you have n factorial number of, so if you have 3, uh, three elements or 3 particles in your system, there are 3 and 3 factorial that means 6 ways of permuting. So, what this says is that you first select s equal to 1 since you want the final wave function to be describing a collection of n bosons. So, then you uh, perform this summation that means uh, you find the image of 1 under that permutation that means 1 goes to something because if you fix the permutation 1 will go to something, uh, 2 will go to something else, 3 will go to something else like that. So, it will it will all go to different different numbers you create this wave function like that. So, this may be p, p 1 becomes a p 2 
see uh, so p p1 will become 2 so p1 will actually be 2 say in this example so this will become 2 then p2 will become 1 then like that so you can have many such examples so you have uh, n factorial such possibilities and you have to add them all up and what this means is the uh, basically the number of uh, is the order of the permutation that means is the number of uh, interchanges you have to do to get back 1, 2, 3 original order. I mean the standard ordering 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 up to n is the standard uh, ordering. So, if you take some random permutation and the question is how many times I have to interchange any two of them so that I get back uh, the original sequence of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 up to n. So, that is called the order of the permutation. So, uh, some permutation will require only one interchange, some will require two interchanges and so on and so forth. So, so basically you take uh, in this case it does not matter because one uh, it is s is 1. So, 1 raise to mod p is always 1. So, for fermions it makes a difference, for bosons it does not matter. So, you just add up all those things and then divide by n factorial. So, after doing that you are guaranteed that this final answer on the right hand side will definitely describe a collection of n bosons because the, uh, the uh, end result will be uh, purely symmetric under the exchange of any two particles. So, therefore, it will describe n bosons. So, similarly if you want to describe a system of n fermions, what you will have to do is you have to select s equals minus 1. So, if you select s equals minus 1, it absolutely is important to know what the uh, permutation, I mean what the order of the permutation is. So, the order of the permutation will be the number of interchanges you have to do to that uh, sequence. So, the general permuted sequence in order to uh, restore it back to its original uh, starting sequence namely 1, 2, 3 up to n. So, this method namely 8.56 uh, correctly tells you how to construct a wave function which is properly either properly symmetric or properly anti-symmetric under the exchange of any two coordinates thereby uh, successfully describing a system of n bosons or n fermions. So, starting from a wave function that is neither. So, that means if you start from a wave function that does not have any proper symmetry 8.56 allows you to construct properly a system of fermions or bosons. Okay. So, now with that uh, tool in our toolkit, uh, so we have acquired that tool in our toolkit. So, now let us proceed further and see if we can uh, understand how to uh, annihilate and create actual material particles. So, in order to do that, I am going to introduce uh, an, o an operator which is basically an annihilation operator, but as of now it does not annihilate, uh, it annihilates coordinates, it does not annihilate particles because the distinction is because uh, to annihilate particles you have to actually annihilate a boson or a fermion. But uh, by implication see if you have a system of n bosons if you annihilate a boson you will end up a, with a system of n minus 1 bosons. So, that means there is the starting state describes n bosons, the ending state describes one fewer bosons but it, they are all still bosons. So, that is our ultimate goal. We want to be able to create a system uh, of one fewer of those quantum particles. So, that thereby by implication the starting state was properly either fully symmetric or properly fully anti-symmetric in the case of fermions. And then when you annihilate a quantum particle you will end up with one less fermion thereby the final wave function will be a a properly anti-symmetric wave function of one less fermion or properly symmetric wave function of one less boson. So, that is the whole idea. So, but then uh, so th that is accomplished in two steps. One is first you introduce 
an operator that annihilates coordinates. So that means uh, I am going to introduce an operator called A uh, bracket R where R is the coordinate. Uh, so some coordinates going to be annihilated and replaced by this coordinate R. So, you see the coordinates of the particles are R1, R2 up to Rn. So, what this AR does is it just uh, preferentially picks the last one. So, it takes the nth coordinate and uh, freezes the coordinate of that to be R. So, that is basically annihilating a coordinate. So, you see it is annihilation because what is annihilation? means it is destruction, it is just synonymous with the word destruction. So, that means you are erasing R n. So, you are deleting R n and replacing it with R which is another vector. Okay. So, but that R vector is not part of the positions of any particle. See R 1, R 2, R n, R 3 up to R n are the positions of the actual particles. But uh, R is some externally, uh, uh, so that A is a function of R. So, it is an operator which uh, freezes uh, one of the coordinates to be that externally supplied R. So, what this does is it takes R n and freezes that to be R. So, now you see you have a wave function which is a function of one fewer coordinate. But then uh, you see the problem is the following. The problem is that even if you started off with a wave function that was properly symmetric or anti-symmetric, the moment you preferentially uh, freeze the last one, the position of the last one to R, then you are immediately destroying the uh, carefully constructed symmetry of that wave function because now you have preferentially picked out the last coordinate and frozen its value to R. So, what you are doing is effectively you are of course succeeding in reducing the number of coordinates from n to n minus 1 which is the major important I mean that was the main goal. But uh, the price you are paying for that in this method is that you are destroying the carefully constructed symmetry of the original wave function. So, the end result is neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric under exchange of any two particles because uh, for obvious reasons. So, you cannot say for example, this these two cannot uh, fully exchange, uh, you, you cannot really exchange this with this. Okay. So, so that is the reason why the final uh, result will not be symmetric or anti-symmetric. So, the question is we have to understand how to do this. So, uh, but uh, keep in mind that you can always uh, rewrite uh, this. Uh, this. Uh, so, you might think that uh, you know freezing what, what does freezing R n to R means? It is like uh, I mean it is like erasing R n. So, it does not seem like a very mathematical operation. So, if you are one of those people who get uh, uncomfortable by using words like erase R n replace it with R. If you want a more mathematical description of that procedure, what it means is you take this wave function multiply it by a Dirac delta function of R n minus R and integrate over all R n. So, that is what I mean by freezing the value of R n to R. And of course, uh, one should not forget that there is a in the definition of A itself, A of R, there is a square root of n there for reasons that will become clear later. Okay. So, this is called the annihilation of a coordinate. So, this is an operator that annihilates a coordinate. So, similarly, you can introduce operators that create a coordinate. So, if you have a wave function originally with n number of uh, particles, uh, so a wave function which depends on R1, R2, R3 up to Rn you can create a coordinate. So, that means you can bring in a coordinate that did not exist previously namely R n plus 1 which never existed. But now the idea is that that coordinate has been created and it has now been uh, preferentially chosen to be equal to R. So, which is precisely what this Dirac delta does. 
So, it actually creates a new coordinate where none existed before. So, there were only n coordinates starting from R, R1, R2 or to Rn. Now, you create one more coordinate namely Rn plus 1. But here uh, you see from 8.60 it is very obvious why I am saying that the end result is neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric that is really obvious now. Because if you take this if it was pure perfectly say symmetric under the exchange, but this end result is not symmetric under the exchange of R, R, R1, R2, R3, Rn and Rn plus 1 also. So, that means the new sequence is all the way up to Rn plus 1 it does not stop at Rn. So, the new sequence has n plus 1 coordinates. So, now if you interchange Rn and say Rn plus 1 you clearly will not get back the same result or any other sensible result. I mean that what you will get will be unrelated to this one. So, it is neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric if you try to mix up Rn plus 1 with any of these ones. So, that is the reason why we really needed this operator 8.56 because uh, every time we try to annihilate or create a coordinate we are actually messing with the symmetrization that already existed in the wave function. So, now that I have motivated that uh, introduction of those operators now, now you can see why I am going to write this. So, in the next class what I am going to show you is that this definition makes perfect sense. So, what this definition does now the C of R actually annihilates a quantum particle either a boson or a fermion at position R. So, if, if you select small letter s equals plus 1 you are actually annihilating a boson at position R. See unlike you are not I mean A of R annihilates a coordinate whereas C of R actually annihilates a boson if you select s, s equals plus 1 it annihilates a fermion if you select s equals minus 1. Okay. So, uh, I am going to stop here and in the next class I am going to prove this claim. So, I am going to show you why this way you can easily guess why this is. So, what this anti-symmetrization does is uh, of course, as an aside I have to point out you might be wondering how do you pronounce this symbol. Uh, this seems like some of those uh, uh, symbols that uh, you know celebrities give to their children. So, instead of actual names they call them with funny symbols and this looks like one of those symbols. So, this is actually some script beta. So, you can think of it as script beta. Okay. So, uh, I am going to start calling it script beta subscript s. Okay. So, this subscript beta subscript s is the one that properly symmetrizes or anti-symmetrizes wave functions. So, the reason why you need this is because uh, you see it is clear what this is doing. So, if you want to hit this with some wave function you do not have to be very careful about what you are hitting it with. So, it you can hit it with something that is neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric. What this does is it first pre-processes that wave function. It takes a wave function that is neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric and makes it first properly symmetric. Then it annihilates a coordinate. So, now once it is properly symmetrized you see the annihilation happens democratically over all the coordinates because once it is symmetrized the last one uh, you know you will have uh, every coordinate gets an opportunity to be the last one because A of R actually annihilates the last coordinate. It is not as if R n is always the last coordinate because once you properly symmetrize or anti-symmetrize every coordinate gets an opportunity to be the last one. So, then you, a, when A of R hits that, so there is a democratically all coordinates get to uh, be annihilated uh, and made equal to R uh, you know one by one. So, once that happens then uh, you see the eventual wave function is still uh, uh, now going to not respect any symmetries for reasons I have already told you. So, then you have to again hit that with this proper symmetrization. So, this uh, this beta subscript s basically it is something like uh, you know like sweepers like when you 
make a mess somebody comes and cleans it up for you. you usually you have to do it yourself but it's like having some kind of a household help so this beta s comes and cleans up all the mess you have made so so it anti-symmetrizes or symmetrizes then it allows you to annihilate then when you annihilate you have made a mess because it ceases to be symmetric or anti-symmetric and then again this beta comes and clears up that mess and the eventual wave function is either properly symmetric or properly anti-symmetric. So, in the next class I am going to explain to you how, how all this works practically. So, I am also going to uh, define similarly the creation operators of fermions or bosons. So, then we can proceed and write down uh, operators in quantum mechanics containing many particles in terms of these creation and annihilation operators just like we did in the earlier examples and that will be very interesting because now you have a, a theory of material particles that are being created and annihilated and you will be able to describe them in terms of those operators and which is very exciting. So, I am going to stop here and I hope to see you in the next class. Mm -hmm.